Good morning, church. Good morning. Since everybody seemed to be uh, gathered out in there, but uh, they'll work, th- work their way in. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers here. Um, uh, I have a couple of announcements. <laughs> kind of blank for a second. Uh, have a couple of announcements, and then we'll get into worship. Uh, first off, Jessica wanted to thank all of the leaders, all the volunteers for VBS, and thank you guys for taking your time and evenings to work with the youth, the young kids. So we have in our prayer focus this week, we have in our community, we have Hope with Options, which is a pregnancy uh, resource center. Helps a lot of people who are going to be parents, uh, help them through the process and they're currently moving right now uh locations so we'll be praying for them and their smooth operation and moving and in our church we have our youth camp we're going to silver lake we're heading out thursday and we're going to come back monday so we're going to pray for them pray for all the kids pray for god to touch the lives and the hearts of the kids uh in our missional we have hendel smith and ryan chapman and they do a lot they do a lot of the overseas uh managing missions and outreaches for the u.s and canada so that's no pressure on them (laughs) uh yeah so i'll pray for us and we'll get into worship dear heavenly father i want to thank you so much for this time you've given us to come together and to worship god i pray that you'll open our hearts to the message and uh, to the worship lord god i pray that you will just be with hope with options lord and uh guide them and uh speak into their lives in just the parents soon to be the mothers soon to be and help them with a smooth moving and all those things and lord i pray that you will be with our youth our youth group with silver lake coming up lord i pray that you would just be with the youth kids touch their hearts be with the leaders lord help them be the guys that you called them to be god i pray that you will be with kendall and ryan lord as they are managing the missions lord give them the guidance and the wisdom to reach the right people and speak speak the right things and just of your heart in your heavenly name amen Amen. Amen. thank you connor you guys so much for those who helped and volunteered at vbs it was phenomenal it was awesome A little chaotic, a little chaos, but that didn't hurt anybody. And um, we had 45 kids, so praise God, we had 45 kids come. Um, We had some awesome people volunteer. I had a friend um, from Free Methodist come and help me out. Without her, it would have been impossible. I know she doesn't go here, but Erin Zander is amazing. I wanted to give another special shout-out. She also isn't in here, but she was out there in the lobby. Give Janet a round of applause, please. Um, She said something a little quirky, but it stuck with me. If there's a need, there's a Janet. So she (laughs) filled it. All right. She was awesome and amazing. Um, And if you missed out on VBS this year and you really want to volunteer, we have some awesome Sunday school spots open that we need filled. So get your practice in because our hope is 100 kids next year. So thanks. Okay. Now let's hop into some worship. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you both. Glad it went. God, it was a very productive and busy week. Uh, would you please stand as we prepare our hearts this morning? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Aren't you guys grateful this morning that we have a God who saves, who brings peace, who brings hope, who brings healing to our lives? And he's always working. He's always working on us. And I'm grateful for that this morning. Lord, I just pray this morning for all our church family, our pastors, our leaders, Lord, that you would just continue to bless them and protect them and their families, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them strength, that you would give them peace, give them discernment. Lord, we pray for just all the fathers today, God, who are here and who are not here, Lord, that you would help them to raise their children in you, Father, that they would instruct their kids in the way that they should go, Father. Give them wisdom, give them understanding, give them discernment, God, and 
We just pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. I see.
just reminded of his faithfulness and his goodness towards us this morning that, that while we were still sinners, he still died for us. Even if it was just one person, he would, he would do it all because he, God, is love. Here's a few of the names that are just attributed to God. So these are Hebrew names. I just wanted to share a few with you this morning because there are just so many different names. If you even just look at our own alphabet from A to Z, I think there's only a few letters. If you look through the Old Testament and the New Testament, all the different names that are attributed to God, because how do you describe the creator of the universe? So I'm going to read off a few of these Hebrew names. Forgive me if I pronounce them incorrectly. Um, so this is Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord shall provide. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord who is peace. Jehovah Sikhanu, the Lord who is righteous. And he is all those things and so much more that we can't even describe. And even up, being up here this morning and singing praises to his name, I feel unworthy to even say his name sometimes, don't you? But I'm just so grateful for his mercies. I'm so grateful for his forgiveness this morning that he brings healing, that he brings peace, peace that this world cannot give, but only peace that Jesus Christ can give. So let's sing God of Wonders and let's let's just focus on him this morning. Let's put all of our worries aside. Whatever you got to do after church, don't think about it. Don't worry about it. Let's just sing to him. It's all about him. That's why we are here. Amen.
thank you that you paid it all on the cross, God. That we died with you. And that you raised us to new life, God. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. There's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. God, we are so thankful for your promises, God. We just pray for your peace this morning, God. We pray that we would just get a small glimpse that we could comprehend your love for us, how much you love us, Lord. We just praise you this morning. Thank you. Yes, I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no
Father, we thank you that you have adopted us into your family, God. You have translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son, Jesus Christ, God. You have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, God, that we don't have to be slaves to fear. We don't have to be a slave to the things of this world, God, that cause us to worry, that cause us to fear, that cause us to think that you are not enough, that we are not enough, that we're not doing enough, God, but you have paid it all on the cross. So we don't have to worry about that. You have paid for our sins, that if we repent, if we turn from our sins and we turn to you and we put our trust in you, God, you will bring us right back into the fold. So we are just grateful, God, that we have nothing to fear, but your perfect love casts out fear. We praise you this morning. Bless this time as Art shares this message, Lord, that you would bless this time that we have to share in your word, God. Let us not take it for granted, Father. In your name, amen. Got me now? Okay. <laughs> so what kind of things? Well, there's a donut day, a national pickle day, a national honor your bosses day. But as a Christian, Father's Day actually makes sense because we all have one. Um, and none of us would be alive in this world without a father somewhere. Maybe your earthly father was pretty much a washout as a dad. Or maybe you had a good dad. Either way, when you give your life to Jesus, you are instantly giving a perfect what? Father, dad. Right. One who will never leave you, never forsake you. One who planned on you and will never leave you or forsake you. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that. One who planned for you and chose you before the universe. That's in Ephesians 1, if you ever want to look for that. <clears throat> One who loved you no matter how much you ignored him, doing whatever you please as though he did not exist. And one who willingly sacrificed the most precious thing in all the world for you, his only son, Jesus. It is this father who wonders how you and I are doing as, our, as, um, as dads ourselves and will ask us about that when we get to heaven. Make you nervous? Mm, I don't know. <clears throat> if we are fathers, then somewhere our kids have a mom. How do we treat her? How did we treat her? Did we love her as much as we love our own bodies? That's Ephesians chapter 5, in case you haven't met, read that one. Did we pray for her, for our kids? Did we exasperate our children, demand of them a control that we ourselves had not achieved? God especially mentions this. Did our default mode pretty much start and end with impatience because our kids were four and not going on 45. 
we're quick to tell you, tell them, were we quick to tell them when we were sorry, admitted fault, asked for forgiveness? No matter if we all score low on this valuation, God already knows and he provides instant forgiveness, courage, and the ability to start over and do it right. God's Holy Spirit is with us every step of the way, loving, teaching, encouraging, strengthening us. All we have to do as fathers is to be willing. If you have been a good dad, praise God. Don't waste time patting yourself on the back, though. On this Father's Day, show other men by example and prayer how to love their kids. So let us all say together, from the heart, the prayer that Jesus gave us as a model. But unfortunately, I forgot to get it on the screen. So maybe you know living uh, translation by heart. The only one I can remember is King James. But I'll read it from the living translation because that's our Bible here. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgotten those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are changing us to be like your son, Jesus. Teach us to care for our children as you care for us. Amen. All right, good. Well, today we are in Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43, and we'll be reading from the uh, Living Translation. And you also find the same passage in Mark 9 and Luke 8, in case you're interested. But first, let's do a review. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been here for some of the last uh, lessons, that, that uh, sermons that we've had in Mark. But anyway, as we learned in Mark 4, that Jesus had been teaching a very large crowd by the sea, which, according to Mark 2, was probably in the town of Capernaum, the town where Peter and Jesus lived. In the evening at Jesus' request, if you remember, in Mark 4, he and his disciples traveled across the Sea of Galilee and were caught in a great windstorm from which Jesus rescued them. In Mark 5, we read that Jesus and the disciples eventually landed in the the country of the Gadarenes, where Jesus immediately met a man with an unclean spirit. Jesus forced the unclean spirit out of the man and into a herd of pigs, which then ran into the sea and drowned. The local people then were fearful, and they begged Jesus to leave their area. Mark 4.35 says that they made the first crossing in the evening So did they return in the dark, or did they wait till the next morning? Well, the scripture didn't tell us. I'm assuming that they probably didn't venture out at night, but how many of here are fishermen that fish at night? Oh, yeah, okay. That's a good good time to fish, isn't it? (laughs) So maybe they weren't afraid of it. In Mark 5, 21 through 24, we have that up there. There we go. Jesus got into the boat again and went back uh, to the other side of the lake where a large crowd had gathered around him on the, sh- on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My l- little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. So they went back to Capernaum, and when they got there, there was a large crowd, which makes me think it was another day rather than that night, and one of which was a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus. Now, synagogue officials occupied important positions in Jewish societies. One of my references stated that they were the ones responsible for all the non-priestly duties in a synagogue. Like we have people in the church that do that work. <clears throat> they were usually hook, looked on with honor and often were a leading citizen in the community. 
My question is, was he one of the Pharisees in Mark 3, 6 who were planning to destroy Jesus? If this is so, this would indicate a dramatic change in his attitude toward Jesus. Possibly it was brought on by the sudden, maybe even overnight, illness of his daughter. And, you know, that sometimes happens to us. Maybe not much uh, the fear of death of somebody, but could happen. It certainly happens to me on lots of other minor things, maybe. As long as I can say, no problem, I've got this. I do not need God. I could pray, but I already know what I'm going to do, so why pray? Anybody have attitudes like that? <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, but when God upends my world, that's when I come right back to God. <clears throat> but to the God who controls the wind, God who controls the waves, God who controls everything, everything that touches me. We come running back to him. Well, Jairus was a man in charge, but God got, him, got his attention with something he couldn't control, whether his daughter would live or die. God uses situations which seem desperate to us to bring us to Jesus, to show us what will last forever and what doesn't matter. So Jesus, Jairus, maybe some of the disciples, we find out later there were three anyway, all of the large crowd who met Jesus on his return were heading, probably in a hurry, to Jairus' house. He thought it was pretty desperate. Then came the interruption. I don't know if you saw this as an interruption, but it kind of surprised me. In Mark 25, 525 through 30, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd <clears throat> and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? <clears throat> yes, okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. I lost the track. Oh, there it is. All right. God, hasn't God already directed Jesus toward Jairus? I don't know how you are about interruptions, but they are really annoying to me. If I have a task, if I have a focus, if I'm doing something really important, uh, irritation when interrupted is always, usually, always my first <laughs> response but god is never interrupted never irritated when we interrupt him with our prayers and jesus realized at once that the healing power had gone out for him so he turned around in the crowd and said who touched my robe who interrupted jesus it was a desperate woman a woman who had suffered for 12 years with a medical condition a woman who had received no relief from the treatments of doctors. A woman who had spent all of her resources trying to get help. A desperate woman who had heard of people touching Jesus, hoping to be healed. We find that in Mark 3, verse 10. So she did. She touched Jesus, and she was immediately healed. Mark likes the word immediately, as recorded many places in Mark and here in verse 5, chapter 5, 29. But this is how God always works in his time. 
It may require our patience in our time to understand his immediate response to our prayers in his time. He just does things differently than we do. <clears throat> Mark five thirty one through 34, we read, His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. God does not want us to turn off our minds. He wants us to think. But we must realize that human reasoning and human limits and human fears will never lead us to understand God and his love. Look at the times the disciples were wrong about God's power and goodness. In Mark 1, the men who were to become his apostles came to him after he had gone to a desolate place and prayed. They chastised him for not being where they thought he should be. <laughs> they chastised him again um, in Mark 4.38 they have, they, uh, we find them, if you remember, they were panicked and they were bailing for their lives. And they finally wake Jesus up and they chastise him for not helping. Oh, my goodness. So what was Jesus' response to this help, helpless, interrupting woman? Jesus is never distracted from his father's work. He knew someone had touched her. And out of her faith for help, he went looking for her. <laughs> I personally find that really encouraging to know that he's looking for me. What else do we need to understand about this woman? Not only was she physically miserable, she took great risk in touching Jesus. Her desperation made her whole. Why might she have been frightened? Well, remember, she was a Jew under the Mosaic law. And in Leviticus 13 through 15 constitutes what, what uh, constitutes uncleanliness before God. It's very complicated. And Leviticus 15 verses 25 through 30 specifically concerns a woman who has a discharge of blood for many days. She would be considered unclean and was therefore um, required to be careful not to touch anybody else in order to not make them unclean before God. You might think that's harsh, but that's what God uh, expects, what he expected out of the Jews. So this ailment would result in social and spiritual penalties, such as being ostracized in society. She shouldn't have been in the crowd. It could cause her to be separated from her family it could cause her to be segregated in the synagogue. She would have no place to worship. So she might have gotten into trouble just by touching Jesus on his robe. What is always Jesus' response when we need him? And he said to her, and he says to you, and he says to me, daughter, son, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. I trust the woman was as comforted by these words as I am when I read them. In Mark 5, 36, 35, and 36, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. So how are the words, Jesus' Jesus's words to the woman and to Jairus, like God's word to, through Moses to Israel when they planned to enter the promised land? 
Joshua chapter 1 says, I will not fail you. I will not abandon you. Be strong and courageous. What are the core promises of Jesus' encouragement to the woman and, and to Jairus? To the woman, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And to Jairus, he said, don't be afraid. Just have faith. To all believers today, which I hope, I trust that every one of you are, John 14, 27 says, Jesus was teaching <clears throat> between the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane. It's kind of interesting, this uh, 13 through 17 chapters, God spends teaching us what Jesus taught the apostles. He said, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. One commentator, re commentator reduced these words to keep on believing, stop being afraid. And then in Mark 5, 37 through the end of the chapter, he said, just then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. <clears throat> what was the commotion and the weeping and wailing in a Jewish society? What caused that? Well, if you could read some of the history and what have you, and, and I guess it's been done in other countries and even in this country maybe, is they were hired mourners. When someone died, you hired somebody so that the community around you would know that you were rich and that somebody important had died. <clears throat> Notice that Jesus says the child is not dead. Jesus said the same thing about Lazarus. Lazarus has fallen asleep. The disciples replied, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. The Bible uses the word asleep to describe a believer whose body has died. Jesus says, he who believes in me will live. And even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. The crowd laughed at him in verse 40. But he made them all leave, and he took the, the girl's father and the mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was laying. Holding her hand, he said to her, little girl, get up. And literally, it's little lamb, get up. I, I thought that was kind of sweet. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Why would Jesus tell Jairus and his family not to tell anyone what had happened? Well, we read in Mark 1.45 that Jesus' miracles attracted so much attention that the crowds uh, came, to, that the crowds came that were a huge hindrance. And Jesus responded to sickness when God told him to. But Jesus came as a savior from sin. The healing was a compassionate proof that he was God who could, who could forgive sin. Why would Jesus tell them then to give the girls something to eat? <laughs> I like this. Because she needed food. After her death, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Needed food after her death to life experience. God cares about us. He loves us. No detail is too small for his love. I'm going to close in with a couple of verses from the Gospel of John. God saw fit to use the Apostle John to record the words of Jesus as he taught the apostles on his last night before his death. <clears throat> Two verses have come to be a great encouragement to me in these days that we are living of 
chaos in the world from wars, disease, famines, persecution, economic failures, which are causing mass migrations of people from all over the world who are fleeing the chaos in their lives trying to find peace. <clears throat> John 14, 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and afraid. And John 16, verse 33 says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. He's not saying there will be no trouble in our lives. He's saying there will be. But we can still have peace in the midst of those troubles because we belong to Jesus. <clears throat> Who then, if that is so, must be at fault if I do not have peace? It's got to be me. Because God gave it to us. The Holy Spirit gave it to us. Jesus gives us peace. And Israel, as Israel is preparing to enter the land promised them in Genesis 12, God through Moses in number 6 said, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. So as you leave today and in the weeks to come, I pray that you will also enjoy God's promised peace. Amen? And don't forget this song. I am no longer a slave to fear. I am what? Child of God. Amen. Okay. Thank you all very much. You're dismissed.